Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Testing and Optimizing SATA Power Management with DevSleep. My name is Mike Micheletti and I'm a product manager responsible for the SAS and SATA protocol layer test equipment that we make here at Teledyne LaCroix. I do appreciate you joining us today. As always, I encourage you to type in any questions that may come up during the webinar using the chat box on your screen. I will try to address any questions I can at the end of the presentation. Also, I will send out the slides to everyone later today. So I'm just back from Taiwan. Last week, the SATA IO held their annual interop workshop in Taipei. I'll give you the highlights in a minute, but one of the more interesting observations I had was during the flight over. So I've recently got a new Ultrabook, one of these Haswell systems, super thin, super power efficient. I was able to work in battery mode for nine and a half hours during the flight. I know, that's hard to believe that I would actually work for nine hours during a flight. Actually, I was watching video most of the time, but still very impressed with the battery life on these new laptops. And this is only possible because of power management and dev sleep, which is the topic of our webinar today. I'll do a quick review of the SATA power management model, including the new DevSleep compliance tests. Then we'll talk about power management at the system level and how that affects the SATA interface. It's interesting to look at what real world systems are doing with power management, what's considered best practices for battery power devices. Last year, SSDs represented about 25% of the client PC market. But when you look at just Ultrabooks, it's closer to 86%. So SSDs are making big inroads. Form factor is part of the appeal in the laptop market. But the performance advantage you get with SSDs, that's really been one of the main reasons to spend the extra money on flash for a client PC. Another advantage is that SSDs use less power than hard drives, up to five times more power efficient. And then finally, Another attribute that makes Flash ideal for mobile applications is that there's no spin-up time. So you can use more aggressive power management on mobile platforms without the latency that you're more likely to see with a hard drive. So better user experience. It took a long time for power management to become mainstream. It really wasn't until the SATA 3.1 spec in 2011 that they made it a logo requirement. So officially it's required that you support power management, but it's not required that you enable it on your production product. Of course, if you're targeting mobile applications, then power management has always been a must have feature. Before 2011, what we saw was partial and slumber modes. These are the main power management commands which are sent by the link layer. Normally, both sides are capable of issuing the PM requests. And there's always an acknowledgement needed from the far end. So there's a handshake. With today's PCs, partial mode gets used almost continuously by AHCI on both the laptop and the desktop. It has very low exit latency, like 10 microseconds. It's usually actually less than that with real devices. And then slumber mode is also widely used now. Uh, here you would turn off additional circuitry and you're allowed up to 10 milliseconds to return to fire ready. So 10 milliseconds exit latency on slumber mode. And now there's a third low power state called dev sleep. Only the host can initiate dev sleep. Uh, there's no acknowledgement needed. The device must accept the dev sleep signal. And here power to the Phi interface is entirely removed. So this saves substantially more power than slumber. Higher exit latency for sure with 20 milliseconds to return to fire ready, but still that's relatively quick recovery from dev sleep. A key advantage of dev sleep is the simplicity. It's performed with a sideband signal using the existing 3.3 volt power pin, which was really never used in SATA 2. So DevSleep now has implemented this functionality with 
basically no changes to the actual SATA connector. This extra pin now becomes a dedicated dev sleep signal. You can think of it as an on-off switch where the host can turn off most of the power to the drive. The other big distinction here is that there's no COM wake signal. The drive doesn't have to keep the SATA interface active to detect the wake up. So basically the drive can turn off more circuitry when it's in dev sleep, the PLL, the clock, plus the transmitter and the receiver. The host will deassert dev sleep when it needs to wake up at any time. So uh, when you're in dev sleep, you only need minimal circuitry enabled, like a low power FET to detect that the dev sleep line is toggling. The power savings are substantial. Uh, a typical SSD will draw 100 milliwatts when in slumber mode. When in dev sleep, the drive can go as low as 5 milliwatts. That's a 20x improvement in power efficiency, yet the exit latency is only 2x slower compared to slumber. So now dev sleep represents sort of a middle ground between slumber and off. That is, well, it's well suited for SSDs because there's no spin up time. You don't need to wait for the head to move with an SSD. So in a lot of ways, it was really designed for flash. It's one of the reasons that these ultrabooks are getting such great battery life. As I mentioned, I was in Taipei last week. The SATA IO held plug vest number 13. One of the main goals at this workshop was to test TPR 59 and 69, which have been in development a while and affect the transmitter electrical tests. I think it was a successful workshop from that regard, but there's still a lot of data to, to analyze. For the digital layer test suites, we were running our dev sleep compliance tests. This was really the second dry run for these new tests, so we were able, able to meet the SATA requirement for proving these out at a, live, at a live event. We'll walk through some of the details of these individual tests next. Now the SATA IO has always tested link layer power management in the digital test portion of the spec. This is the original list of tests that focus on power management or IPM, but now they've added some new tests specifically to verify dev sleep mode. The IPM 12 and 13 are only performed if the device supports dev sleep and these two tests at the bottom here are still considered informative. So I'll explain why in a second. Here we're looking at the dev sleep state timing diagram and the definitions for these timing values. I'll go through these quickly, but one important note, the DXET that you see here is not in, this, in the current spec. That's the blue text, right? There's a proposal pending to add this timing parameter, but it's not approved at this point. So for that reason, the dev sleep tests are still informative. The main elements that we're interested in testing in dev sleep are the timing windows to make sure the device responds quickly enough to the dev sleep signaling. There are specific timing parameters that it must conform to. When looking at this diagram, you can consider the top portion as the logical state of the data lines. And then the lower portion is the logical state of the dev sleep pin. DMDT, that's the debounce time for the device. This is not really tested by the compliance program currently. This means that the device should allow 10 microseconds of debounce time before it starts detection of a dev sleep transition. Uh, dev sleep is a slow moving signal, so you want to avoid any chance of a false detection. So debounce basically should be observed on both the on and the off transition, and that is a 10 microsecond timing parameter. There's MDAT, which is the minimum device sleep assertion time. So the host needs to assert dev sleep for at least 10 milliseconds. It's not considered a valid dev sleep signal until it's been detected for 10 milliseconds. 
one caveat, the device can request a longer MDAT in their identified data log. So the software actually checks that during the compliance testing. DXET, this is the maximum amount of time from the point where the dev sleep is asserted to the point where the device is actually asleep. This is the value that's not actually defined in the spec. Instead, it just says, devices shall not respond to any communication from the host when in dev sleep. So to test this, we issue dev sleep, and then we send a COM reset after 100 milliseconds. If he responds to the COM reset, he should fail. So it seems that the original designers of dev sleep didn't want to mandate a specific timing parameter here. They claim this is a vendor-specific implementation, but they also didn't want to mandate any specific power savings or power levels when you're in dev sleep. So the problem is that we need a timing parameter here in order to confirm the device is asleep. What's a reasonable amount of time to wait before we ping the device and make sure he's asleep? It turns out some devices go to sleep in 10 milliseconds, others in 100 milliseconds. Some devices take several seconds. So they would obvi obviously fail this, this portion of the test. But again, this is still informative from the SATA logo testing perspective. Then the DETO, or Device Sleep Exit Latency Timeout. So once we deassert dev sleep, the device should be able to respond to a calm wake within 20 milliseconds. So this is effectively the exit latency for dev sleep, 20 milliseconds. We use the same setup for performing dev sleep tests as with the other digital tests. This is the Teledyne LaCroix Sierra platform, which is approved by the SATA IO for doing all the device side digital tests. This includes the, the NCQ tests, there are general command tests, all the power management or IPM tests can be formed with the same setup. A key point, uh, notice that the dev sleep test requires both a data connection and a power connection. So we can toggle that dev sleep signal. This, this is done using a special power expansion card that's installed at the back of the box. So let's just walk through the test steps. I'll do this with some screenshots from an actual test. So these are actual captures using the protocol analyzer of an IPM12 test. This is where we verify the device enters dev sleep properly. Again, we're using the host emulator on the Sierra tester to link up with the device like a real host. We send an identify. Looking at the response, we can verify that the device supports dev sleep in the identify device string. Then we send a set features where we enable the dev sleep. This image shows the frame inspector where it defines the subcommand shown as sector count 09 here in hexed. So this is how you enable dev sleep with a set features. With that set, we can go ahead and assert the dev sleep signal. Just like with a real system, only the host can initiate dev sleep. This is done asynchronously. There's no handshake needed. The dev sleep signal must be asserted at least 10 milliseconds to be considered valid. We timestamp an event and call it dev sleep in the trace. We actually show it in the trace. Even though it's occurring outside the normal SATA protocol traffic. The device is supposed to enter dev sleep right at this point. And then after 100 milliseconds, we send the COM reset, which should be ignored by the device. This is where we've seen the most issues. And it's interesting to look at the actual power consumption during this test, which we can do using the power tracker window. That's available anytime you're using the power expansion card to power a device. The graph at the bottom of this image shows 
actual power consumed by the device in a graphical format. We're actually tracking power, voltage, and current and displaying them in a timeline. So it's correlated to the logical events on the SATA bus. We can see the exact point where dev sleep is asserted. Power sort of flatlines for a while and then drops by about 50%. So the device has clearly detected dev sleep. It's shutting down portions of its circuitry right here. We wait 100 milliseconds and then send COM reset. You can see below, we can actually make X to Y measurements using the timing cursors. And at the end of the 100 milliseconds, we see there's activity from the device. He's actually responding to the COM reset with COM init. And we see the power jump. Uh, so this is clearly an error. The spec says that after entering dev sleep, the device shouldn't respond to host communication, so his receiver is still active, or at least the OOB detection is still active. So uh, this would technically fail the IPM12 test. But as I said, there's, there's some debate about this 100 millisecond timing parameter because it's not defined in the spec. Some devices claim we're sending the common it too soon at 100 milliseconds that their device is not actually in dev sleep yet. If we would wait longer, like two or three seconds, it would pass. So I guess it's reasonable that they would need to do housekeeping before going into dev sleep. But, you know, that should be internal to the drive. They should still turn off their receiver right after the MDAT window. Anyway, so hopefully we'll get, we'll get this clarified by the SATA I.O. group. A quick look at the IPM13, virtually identical sequence here, only we're actually testing the exit latency. So we configure dev sleep the same way with the set features, wait 20 milliseconds, then assert dev sleep. After 100 milliseconds, we deassert the signal. And you can see the PUT just starting to respond with a common knit at the bottom of the screenshot here. So that would pass. The response needs to be within 20 milliseconds, and uh, it's, it's well within that, that timing window. So the mechanics of implementing dev sleep are pretty simple. It gets complicated quickly once you overlay power management that's directed from the higher layers, the software layers. So now we'll, we'll look at some system, system level power management. There are really three levels which can affect power states at the SATA interface. The highest layer, you have things like sleep and hibernate in Windows, which obviously affect power at the storage subsystem level. But they're also designed to lower power to other system level services like the display and the radios and the memory. If we go one layer down, you'll find the power management states at the device level. Here, power management is performed with ATA commands and sent over the ATA bus. Standby immediate, that will spin down a drive normally, but leaves the controller board awake. The ATA sleep command is another device level power management command. It's, it's not used much with SSDs, but generally you'll see VCC removed when you go to the ATA sleep command. This is also known as D3. At the lowest level, we'll see SATA interface power management. This is where you'll find partial and slumber and dev sleep. These are, again, independent of the ATA protocol state of the disk. It's complementary, really of the power management that's that's occurring at that ATA layer. So this might help explain it in a little clearer form. In terms of the SATA controller or the HBA, only D0 and D3 are considered valid logical states for an AHCI device. D0 
is the active state, and D3 is considered very deep sleep, really the equivalent of system-level hibernate. But for all intent and purposes, the device is off when it's in D3. So again, we're talking about the HBA, and it's either up and running, or it's in D3, where you use very little power, and then if there's work to be done and you're in D3, there's a lot more latency to get back to the D0 state. Now the logical device layer. There are four states that are, they're all considered substates really of AHCI. D0 is the working state, no latency, ready to respond. D1 occurs when the controller issues the idle immediate command. This would typically spin down the drive for a rotational media device. So not really used with flash. Then there's D2, which would issue the standby immediate command. Here the device is going to lower its power further, but with higher latency in getting back to the ready state. Then RTD3, or runtime D3, which is actually a newer state normally associated with the sleep command. When you sleep your computer in Windows, you're completely removing power at the device level. But the system is not in the off state, right? It's going to lose any settings, any configuration data for the device. So the controller has to, su has to specifically support RTD3. But it provides lower latency compared to D3 cold, which is basically the off state coming out of a completely powered off condition. So this is the controller and the system software that will direct the device into these various states. At the SATA interface level, there are four states, ready, partial, slumber, and dev sleep. These are all considered substates of the D0 device ready state. So the SATA interface using timers is going to direct the SATA bus to these low, lower power saving states, with dev sleep being the most aggressive. This can be entirely under software control, but it's much more common now that power management is done at the SATA interface level. It's better to do this in hardware, so it's autonomous. Uh, you'll save more power by putting the SATA link into slumber, even though the drive is still considered to be in D0. And uh, you generally want to do this at the link layer where you have the lowest latency. Now, the system software has its own timeouts. When there's no activity at the system level, it will try to save power by issuing ATA commands, idle or standby immediate. What you normally see with a SATA hard drive is that the link wakes up so it can process the ATA command. It flushes its buffers and then immediately returns back to the slumber state. But in the case of SSDs that support dev sleep, here we're seeing a little different behavior. When the ATA layer sends standby immediate, the device flushes its buffers, goes to standby, and then immediately asserts dev sleep. So dev sleep is a new option when the AHCI layer wants to turn off power during D2 or RTD3. It's like the lowest power state that you can put the SATA interface in when saving power at these other layers. We can look at this by looking at what happens with real devices. To do some real-world testing, we used a Lenovo X1, which is a Haswell Ultrabook running Windows 8.1. It has a single SATA M.2 SSD. This is different than the compliance testing setup we looked at earlier, where we were using the host emulator. Here we're running in analyzer mode, and we're just recording the traffic between the Haswell host and a real M.2 device. To see the dev sleep signal, we have to connect the dev sleep pin. There's a special cable to do this that connects to this line. Uh, I think it's pin one plus ground. You can solder this down or use a clip. 
and then we're able to actually detect the changes on that dev sleep line. We can also trigger on the dev sleep signal. So we'll look at some traces in a second here. The first thing that happens is the host will need to configure the drive. This table summarizes the identified device fields for power management. There's a, a long list of identify fields in the identify data log, but these are all the options that a SATA drive would support to take advantage of power management. The device is going to advertise what it supports in this identify string, and then the host will use set feature commands to enable each mode. These are the features that get enabled on the Ultrabook when equipped with an M.2 drive. It's interesting that they chose to disable the automatic partial to slumber transitions. Seems that SSDs prefer to be more explicit when going to slumber, so they don't automatically silently go to slumber. Maybe they want to do more cleanup before going into that lower power state. Uh, dev sleep is also supported. Of course, um, host initiated and device initiated power management are also supported. And so all of these are going to be enabled uh, in, uh, for this specific device. These are the key power management settings on the AHCI side. So on the host side, these are configured by software. They're written into AHCI registers. And well, these basically define how power management will actually operate. There are probably some others that I missed, but these are the most significant. And there are several specifically for dev sleep, like the DITO. This is where the port level sleep timers get set. This is basically your device sleep timeout. How long do you wait before entering dev sleep? There's also something called aggressive link power management and aggressive device sleep mode. These were all designed for mobile applications and they're worth taking a look at. First of all, when it comes to AHCI, there are two levels of host initiated power management. There's hardware based and software based. When we refer to these aggressive modes, we're referring to the hardware based operation. When you enable these modes, the low power states will be initiated automatically without software intervention. The first one, aggressive link power management or SALP, the HBA, the HBA will actually transition to a low power state as soon as there's no commands outstanding. It's the equivalent of setting the partial timer to zero. As soon as there's no commands in the queue, it issues the PM request. There's also a similar aggressive mode for dev sleep where it will automatically transition the bus to dev sleep if there's no commands pending. But here it also needs to look at the PX dev sleep timer. Uh, that has to also have expired. Of course, it can be adjusted to a very low, more aggressive level, so that value can be adjusted by the host. What we see is that not many mobile devices are using this aggressive link management mode, or SALP. But with the SADM, this is often enabled when running in power saver mode. And so we'll, we'll look now at what the Ultrabook does in these two with this, with this specific mode. OK, so we're going to just go through the configuration steps with that Lenovo. Again, this is going to occur at power on or com reset. We see the identify command. And the response below indicates that dev sleep is supported. So he reports that he supported, supports dev sleep. And then the host needs to enable it with a set features. It also enables device initiated power management, or DIPM, by writing a 1 to bit 3 Word 79. And so all of this can be decoded looking at the set feature commands. Here we're looking at traces from the Ultrabook, which show the power management behavior. We're really comparing the AC power versus battery power on the right. So 
once there are no commands pending, assume the, the bus is idle, the host issues PM rec partial. We see this after one millisecond in both cases. So the host is using a one millisecond partial timeout timer. So once it's in partial, then after 60 milliseconds, the, v the device sends a calm wake and then immediately requests slumber. So as I mentioned earlier, the system was not configured to automatically transition to slumber. So that's why we see the calm wake from the SSD. It has to wake up the link to issue the slumber. Again, on the AHCI side, a timer is going to be used to trigger this move from partial to slumber. And uh, what we see is that it's 60 milliseconds for both, whether you're in AC or battery, it's going to be 60 milliseconds to make that transition to slumber. Then when you're running on AC power, the host is going to wait about 10 seconds and then automatically transition to dev sleep. What happens on the battery side, after just 195 milliseconds, the host decides to wake up the device with a calm wake, flushes the buffers, and then issues the standby immediate command. So the drive is told to go to standby. That's an, an explicit ATA command. After seeing that, about two milliseconds later, the target side issues a PM request slumber. The host acknowledges, and the device is now in slumber. Then 200 milliseconds later, the host signals dev sleep. This shows that when the, when the system is in power saver mode and running on battery, software gets involved and adjusts the PX dev sleep timers to about 200 milliseconds. So the total elapsed time on AC is about 10 seconds to get to dev sleep and then on battery we go in about one second of inactivity. So different behaviors when running on battery versus AC. Now we're looking at resume. So this is the real world exit behavior with an ultrabook. Here some activity is going to wake up the system so the host is responsible for deasserting the dev sleep signal always. On the AC power trace we see dev sleep goes low or off and then 20 milliseconds later we see the calm wake handshake and then host goes right into read operations. So that's about 20 milliseconds exit latency on the AC side which is actually right at the upper end of the spec. On the battery side the exit latency is 10 milliseconds. So here the host uses calm reset to reestablish the link and then we see and identify a set features because on battery, recall, the system software transitioned to standby first. So we're really coming out of standby on the battery side where the device loses its settings and needs to be re-enumerated. It looks like lower latency um, uh, is probably due to the calm reset, right? Where the device doesn't have to worry about restoring any software settings. Here, if we were able to scroll down a little further, we'd see that he's re-enumerating re the drive. Take 10, 12 commands to do that. Significantly more latency, like 300 milliseconds or more from the end user's perspective. So there's definitely more latency coming out of dev sleep from standby. So you can see that slumber and partial are used consistently, whether you're on AC or battery. Uh, the dev sleep is used much more aggressively when you're in battery mode. What's really happening is that dev sleep is used anytime the system issues standby. It's definitely considered best practice to flush the cache when you're running on battery before entering dev sleep. It makes sense, you know, as a precaution, you want to store any unwritten data to disk versus just transitioning directly to dev sleep from slumber with the drive still up. So it's, it's a more conservative approach. Uh, you probably notice that dev sleep is only entered after the device is in slumber. So it always goes to slumber first and then you see the dev sleep assertion. 
This is another configuration option. It should probably be considered a best practice. It's definitely what the Intel platform does. Okay, one more upcoming trend and something that we're looking ahead on. Transitional energy reporting is it's a recent enhancement in the SATA 3.2 spec. It gives system software a framework for setting these different timers. Basically, there are two dozen cost fields. They're reported in the Identify Device Data Log. Transitioning from, from Fi Ready to Standby is one, and the one we're looking at here, transitioning from Slumber to Dev Sleep. This represents how long the device needs to remain in Dev Sleep in order to recoup the energy consumed by making that transition from slumber. So basically, there's no free lunch. Uh, the shaded area labeled A and B represents sort of the incremental energy that's expanded to go in and out of dev sleep. Your system guys, you're going to need to consider this round trip cost when setting up your timers. You know, currently we don't see any SATA devices reporting this data yet, but Eventually, the HBA could use algorithms to intelligently figure out the optimum dev sleep timeout. So device vendors have some work to do. They would need to make measurements. They, they would need to populate these fields. Um, but again, right now, we don't see any devices using these. This, this is brand new. Uh, but at some point in the future, systems could become more intelligent about setting these low power timers. So that's a future consideration for testing and validating dev sleep. We should all be encouraged by this uh, increased use of power management in these new platforms. I mean, it's good to be green, right, and, uh, and to save power. These, these features generally are going to require more testing, though. And one of the only ways to actually see what's happening at this layer of the protocol is with a low-level bus analyzer, like the Sierra SAS SATA test platform and so that that's most of the information I wanted to present today we have a few minutes for questions so uh, please type in anything that I could maybe elaborate on uh, I've seen that there's a, a couple of questions that have been entered um, one attendee asks how we can get the new dev sleep tests. Well, these are available in our latest release of our SAS SATA protocol suite, version 580. You do need to have a license key to run the SATA compliance tests. Also, the power expansion card is required, so you have to have that as well. But they're available today, so you can try them. Um, what else? Um, one uh, attendee writes, slide 26, the host appears to be sending a calm reset during dev sleep. Is this an illegal behavior? Okay, so this is the IPM 13 test where we're exiting, we're, we're measuring the exit latency for dev sleep. And you see that we, we're the host, and we do assert dev sleep at this link packet 375. And then, uh, yeah, the next packet is a comm reset from the initiator. So this is where we're testing to make sure the device is in dev sleep, just like in IPM12, to be able to wake the device up and perform that exit latency measurement. You have to first make sure he's asleep. So. Yeah, this probably wouldn't happen with real devices, or it certainly would be considered illegal, but this is common in compliance testing to create air conditions on the line in order to test various recovery mechanisms that the device has. So that, uh, that is the reason the COM resets ap appear there. Okay, it looks like we've almost consumed all of the time we allotted for today's webinar. So I want to thank everyone for joining us.
Uh, of course, I will be uh, sending out the material to all the attendees later in the day. And of course, um, if we didn't get to any of your questions, I'll try to follow up by email. Appreciate you joining us again, and we'll see you next time.